So one of my tasks this morning is a uh, kind of establish a common baseline so that for the rest of the day today and then the rest of the week, we can start off with some big questions to be asking. And the second task is to make the work on the notion that things that seem very clear probably aren't. Things that seem obvious, things that we think we know, turn out to be far less clear than they appear. And part of the challenge of a course like this is to be asking constantly for every issue that comes up, what's not being said here? What are the issues that are not getting discussed? What's not being on the table? And particularly, what is the framework? What is the analytic perspective? What is the overview that is being assumed that if we are to be critical analysts, we must not assume, but rather take as something to be addressed, to criticize, to challenge, and so on. So I'm going to push on. I want to start with what is potentially, uh, or in the face of it, uh, a, a really very simple question. In 1990, the countries of the world met in Jomtien in Thailand and announced that education for all is a global responsibility. And it was literally the countries of the world. There were 150 plus countries. There were all sorts of international organizations. And the declaration was very clear. Education for all is the responsibility of the world. And the world met again in 2000 in Dakar in Senegal, noting that the targets that had been set in 1990 were not reached in 2000. And there were many possible outcomes of that meeting in Dakar. But the actual outcome was to reaffirm the targets and to say these targets that were set in 1990 uh, should be refined and codified a bit, but they are the targets and to change the deadline. So from 1990, it was a 2000 deadline. The current deadline is 2015 for most. Those of you who are very attentive to this will know that the deadline for gender equality in basic education was 2005. And it probably won't surprise you to hear that it wasn't met. Uh, most of the deadlines are 2015. We're now heading toward 2015. And there will be lots of discussions about what should happen after 2015. So the world said education is for everybody. Basic education is for everyone. I, I should note, I'll be talking mostly about basic education because that's what this is about. But we shouldn't let that confuse us about the connections among the parts of the education system. There was a period in which some of the funders, and particularly the World Bank, sought to play off one part of the education system against another, particularly to redirect funding from higher education to basic education, which ultimately, if you think about it, is a very self-destructive process. Meaning, in order to have good basic education, there have to be competent teachers. And where do competent teachers come from? Competent teacher education programs. In order to have competent teacher education programs, there have to be competent teacher educators. And where do competent teacher educators come from? Universities. So the notion that you could take the money away from the university and uh, f increase the funding in basic education is ultimately self-limiting because it means that the improvements intended in basic education can't happen. If you were to put it very crudely, it would be as if you were a runner in the forthcoming Olympics and you were sprinting in the 100 meter dash and you thought, well, if I cut off one leg, I can re redirect all the energy to the other leg. And then I will get there a whole lot faster. And you know that all that would happen is you would fall over. Right? Uh, the education system is a package. And so in that sense, although I'll be talking about basic education, the implications for higher education are very clear. And I trust those of you who have a particular interest in higher education will draw that out as we proceed. So here's the, here's the pretty simple question. If education for all is a global commitment, who's going to pay for that? Whose responsibility is it to pay for that? And why is it that the global commit, the commitment to education for all is not accompanied by some parallel commitment that says paying for education for all is a global commitment and the people of the world should do that. So that's my starting point and it turns out that it's not really such a simple question after all. As I said, often things that appear clear are uh, not so clear. So when you hear that schools are failing, uh, almost every country in the world there's a set of people and often many people and often people in authority who say schools are not doing very well. What exactly is the problem? 
Is it the case, the, is the problem the case that the poorest and the other disadvantaged children in the system don't have access? Is that what's wrong with education systems in, particularly in poor countries? Or is it the problem that those who actually get into school don't learn very much? Is that the problem with the system? Or is the problem that schools function to differentiate and to subordinate, that is schools function far more to control and to suppress than they do to liberate and, development and develop? So where's the problem here? Is it about access? Is it about learning? Is it about the role of schools in society? Is it about what schools do in society? And part of our task over the whole course of the week is to be asking the hard parts of those questions. The first one that's obvious, who gets into school? The second one's not quite so obvious, what do they learn when they get there? And the one that's far less obvious, what role are schools playing? And in whose interest is it to get more children into schools that they don't, where they don't learn anything? In whose interest is it to get more children into schools that primarily serve to differentiate and track and sort and suppress rather than liberate. Uh, if you think about financing of education, what's the problem? Is the challenge to think about how to find more money for education? Or is the challenge to rethink and reaffirm education as a public good, which is a very different tack when thinking about the inadequate financing for education. Okay, those are teasers, right? My task is to try to go down that path of saying things that are, look obvious or not so uh, clear. And the way I'm gonna do that is, here's the outline of where I'm trying to head over the next um, little bit. The, the outline is to break down the discussion into the question of who learns, and what do we know about who gets into school and who doesn't, and what do they do when they get there, then who pays for that, and then I'll ask about why. So those are the titles, I mean, the subsections of the talk. There's no need to write down the PowerPoint. I will make sure that Trina has a copy and you can have it when, you're, when it's convenient to you and to look at it. I did stick in some pictures. This is to remind us that we're talking about learning. It's not just about money. Uh, it's about learning. It's about what happens with learners. This is a teacher in Tanzania, but it's uh, a reminder. So let's ask the question about who learns. Now, we probably, as those of us who are educators, start with a very upbeat notion about getting access to education. Getting access to education is a process of developing individual capabilities. It's a process of learning skills. It's a process of developing the sorts of competences that both individuals seek and a society needs. And what it turns out is, when we look at it, that that's not, in fact, what's happening in the world. That is, that education for all is, in fact, not uh, an equally accessible education for all, that it's not broadly accessible, that it's not egalitarian, that it's not liberating. And I have lots of examples uh, in, the, in the interest of time. I'm going to skip a few. Uh, but let me begin with one just to, just to make the point clear. I spent some time a while ago trying to think about uh, what do high quality schools, what, what makes them stand out? And I was doing some work in Tanzania and so I asked my colleagues which are the high quality schools, secondary schools in this case. And they were all very clear. They gave me the list of what the high quality schools were and my guess is the same thing would happen in most countries. What they were giving me is the list of schools in which the students scored high in the secondary school exam. And that was the ranking system for the secondary schools. And I went and visited one in order to try to make better sense of what was going on. And it turned out in a school that over many years, many years, regularly had students who scored in the top four or five in the country, was a school that had a roughly equal number of female and male students at the starting point, what's called Form 1 in Tanzania, the beginning of secondary school, and way more males than females in Form 4, that is four years later in the secondary school. Among those who made it to Form 4 and did the examination at the end of secondary school, the males and the females scored equally well. So it was not a differentiated uh, of competence between males and females. It was that most of the females didn't get there. Now, should we call that a high quality school? Or should we say that a school that has shown itself 
to be consistently over two decades, to be unable to educate half the population is really a low quality school. Things aren't as they seem. What is quality here? Is quality simply the score on the exam? Or is quality a much larger notion about the ability of schools to enable people to develop their capacities, the ability of a society to educate its young people? So what I'm challenging you with is already notions of access and quality and all of that. Uh, let's look at the, uh, very quickly, the, the notion of sharply differentiated access. Here I'm going to draw on the uh, global monitoring reports starting after the 2000 meeting in Dakar in April of 2000 when the world met in Dakar, they created a monitoring mechanism. And the monitoring mechanism has since 2002 issued a report every year on the state of the campaign for education for all, which actually is a pretty good reference point for looking at what's happening in education in the world. And the, the 2010, this is the 2010 version of it, uh, you probably can't read it, but that's what it says here on the side. The 2010 version of it developed this deprivation and marginalization in education measure. And what it's intended to look at is differentiation in access to education. And so the starting point here is to say, where, let's look at uh, countries where people have, where there is in the population, uh, a percentage of the population that has less than four years of education. So just to get clear on this, these are the countries across the bottom, Philippines at this end, Burkina Faso in Africa at this end. The black dots are education poverty, meaning uh, the percentage of the population that has less than four years of education. So in the Philippines, you can see it's about on the order of 5%. In Burkina Faso, it's on the order of about 70%. You with me so far? Okay. Uh, there is, as part of this measure, the extreme education poverty. People with less than two years of education, so that's the second dot, it's a smaller red dot, and it's lower than the darker dot. And you can see that that too is uh, differentiated. What we're getting at here is education for all turns out not to be, right? Education for all turns out to be significantly differentiated among countries around the world. And if you then combine the access question with poverty, that is, people from the poorest households who also don't get much education. So the example that they're using here is the Yemen example. And for Yemen, for the country as a whole, it's 30%. But for the poorest part of the Yemeni population, it's twice that. It's 60%. Right? General point here is a simple one about the uneven and unequal access to education. Some of you are well aware of that, some not. But it seemed to me really important to take a look at that. And if you add to that gender, uh, so now you have poverty and gender piled up together. To come back to the Yemeni example, it was 30% for the population as a whole. If you add the poorest part of the population, it doubles to 60%. And if you focus on the poorest females, I can't reach quite that high, but it gets to 90%, so it triples. Right? So the education disadvantage for Yemenis doubles with poverty triples with poverty and gender. And that's true pretty much across the board for the countries in, the, in, this, in this set of measures. Th the point again is a fairly simple one. Education for all turns out not to be. Education for all turns out to be dramatically differentiated. Here's one more example of that. This is the case of Nigeria. So it's uh, an effort to look at the situation within a particular country. So this is average number of years of schooling for a set of countries. Ukraine here is at the top, Cuba and some others, Chad and the Central African Republic down at the bottom. This is education poverty, this is education extreme poverty, uh, and Nigeria falls here at 6.7 years. I'm going to start breaking that down, so if it's not clear, stop me now. Okay? If you break that down for Nigeria, if you break that down in, uh, in uh, income stratification, for the poorest Nigerians, the poorest 20%, the fifth bottom fifth of the population, it's three and a half years, not 6.7. For the most affluent fifth of the population, it's 9.7 years. That's not really terribly surprising. More affluent people are likely to get more education. But we can break it down further, and it turns out that there's a significant rural-urban difference. So the most affluent of the rural people are getting 10 years. The least affluent of the rural people are getting 3.3 years. So the gap is getting bigger. 
And if we push it a bit further and then add gender in the process, you can see that the poorest rural girls in Nigeria, I don't know if I'm pushing this around a little, are getting uh, just over two and a half years. The mo most affluent rural males are getting 10.3 uh, years. And if we push it one step further, it turns out that poor rural Hausa girls, that is from the north in Nigeria, are getting three-tenths of a year of education. Right? Education for all is not. Education for all, even in countries that claim to have made great progress in getting people into school, still have this sort of differentiation. That means that people's access to education is heavily dependent on uh, where they're born, urban, rural, uh, what part of the country they're born in, whether they're male or female, whether they have a more affluent family, a less affluent family. Unless you think that was only Nigeria, this is Turkey, and you can see the same kind of differentiation. I haven't done it in the same breakout way, but in the end, it's poor Kurdish girls who are down here in the, in the least access to education and rich rural boys who are getting more access to education. So it's, it's, uh, it's a pattern that's characteristic across uh, much of the world. This is yet another version of it. So it's the extreme education poverty. What percentage of the people in country have less than two years of education? And it, there's Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, Pakistan, and India. And if you add on top of that the gender difference, you can see that it, it gets dramatically larger. And so for the Global Monitoring Report, they make the point that in Kenya, the rural Somali girls generally have less than two years of education. Uh, the net attendance rate for Somali girls is 20%. Education for all is not. Even in countries that report significant achievements in education for all, uh, the differentiation is significant. And what that tells us is that access to education is neither egalitarian nor meritocratic, meaning not entirely dependent on merit, but dependent on a whole bunch of other things that we need to pay attention to in society. Now, so far I've been talking about schooling. We need to take the next step if we're asking the who learns question and find out what happens in schooling. And it turns out that a whole lot of what schooling is about is what I would call socialization. You're going to discover now that some of us who are on the staff of these two courses don't entirely agree. And so there may be some fruitful arguments among us. But what I'm pointing to here is preschool children, this is Colombia, who are lined up waiting to go into school. Now a few of you said you worked with younger children. I uh, live with, my spouse is, uh, has run an early childhood program for a very long time. So I have lots of experience with younger children. And there's no defensible learning reason for making three-year-olds line up to get into school. You cannot explain that in learning terms. Something else is going on. And what the society is doing is teaching obedience of one sort or another, in this case, lining up. So that's the Columbia example. Uh, this is the China example. That's the England example. Uh, and here the children are in Kenya. Why is it that preschool children in Kenya need a uniform? What is the learning rationale for a uniform for preschool children? Uh, the point I'm making is a pretty simple one, and that is starting with the youngest children, schools are doing lots of things which may have nothing to do with learning. And in this case, I'm offering a simple-minded little example about how even with the youngest children, who are not yet even in the ordinary school system, there is an expectation of the system that they're learning the sorts of behaviors uh, that the, this is India, that they're learning the sorts of behaviors that the society expects from them. And that's what schooling is about uh, for a good part of, of what it does. Now, as countries of the world have gotten closer and closer to the education for all target, the discussion has shifted to from access to quality. So the discussion has begun to shift, and I think in a pretty dramatic way, uh, about it's important not only to get people into school, but it's important to uh, focus on the learning issues. And that turns out to be primarily a discussion about examinations of one sort or another, as if they were the only useful measure of whether or not anybody's learning, even though those who study examinations are pretty clear that for the most part they don't tell us much about learning. So on the one hand, we have a great focus on 
uh, let's all talk about learning and the quality of education. On the other hand, we have uh, use of measures that don't tell us very much about learning and about the quality of education. And uh, particularly dramatic in this respect is that the World Bank has issued last year its uh, education strategy for 2020, and it calls it learning for all. But if you take the time to read through the World Bank 2020 learning for all strategy, you find out that there's not much in there about learning. There's not much in there about the process of learning, about how students learn, about curriculum, about pedagogy, about the sorts of things that educators are concerned about if they were worried about or concerned about learning. They're not in that uh, report, in that strategy document, concerned about research on learning, that is, what do we know about the learning process and how do we apply that in classrooms. There's very little attention to the notion that the most effective learning takes place in face-to-face -face interactions uh, and that therefore the task is to maximize face-to-face -face interactions and to maximize the ability of teachers uh, to work in a face-to-face -way, face way with students. And there is no support in that document for any sort of research on learning other than its own research. So the World Bank says here's a document on learning for all and it turns out to be a pretty technical document about inputs and outputs and it has not much to say about learning, and it certainly has nothing to say about how it is that research on learning in the poor countries of the world will be strengthened so that that research then can influence what comes next. Things aren't as they seem, okay? Let me push on and say, uh, uh, push on in the discussion and think about who is uh, to pay for all of this. That's the next part of the discussion. So, as I said, my question at the outset was, education is, for all, is a global responsibility, but paying for it is not. And there really is a tension in that idea, right, that the world is responsible. We have said it. We, are, we agree. Education for all is what we're all responsible for. Um, but paying for it is still a national responsibility. And so we need to think about how that plays itself out and what are the consequences of going down that path. Uh, there is a particularly dramatic part of this uh, Education for All campaign because the funding agencies, the aid agencies in the world, said in Dakar in 2000, in very clear terms, that no country should be blocked from achieving Education for All, and no country that had a reasonable plan for achieving Education for All should be blocked from doing that for lack of resources. So it's a pretty dramatic commitment. The affluent countries of the world and their funding agencies said any country that's got a reasonable plan will have sufficient resources to achieve that. And it turns out that, is, uh, that turns out not to be the case. And so let me then come back to this funding gap idea that Alicia mentioned earlier. And the funding gap notion goes something like this. The calculation of this is, again, the Global Monitoring Report in 2010. The calculation in 2010 was that there would need to be every year from 2009 to 2015 on the order of 36 billion U.S. dollars to achieve education for all by the 2015 deadline. And they started with a notion of what are the resources available, since education funding is still a national responsibility, what are the resources available at the country level? And the starting point was the current resources available are $12 billion. If the countries of the world uh, have a positive economic growth outcome, it was a little hard to imagine anybody thinking that in 2009, but <laughs> assuming in 2009 you could make some really optimistic assumptions about growth, uh, the uh, assumption was that there would be an additional several billion dollars. If the countries would do better at managing their money, there would be a few million dollars more, billion dollars more, and the resulting gap would be $16 billion. So between the 36 and what could come out of national resources, there's still a gap of $16 billion per year, 2009, 2015, to reach the education for all uh, targets. And where's that going to come from? Well, the assumption was that foreign aid had to play a role in that. Foreign aid at the time in 2009 was $3 billion. So we're looking for a $16 million gap, right? Billion dollar gap. And foreign aid was going to have three billion of that $16 billion gap. Uh, the foreign aid providers 
uh, in this case, in a meeting in Glen Eagles in Scotland, promised that they would do a bit better, and there have been some additional promises after that, and that's going to generate some uh, uh, additional resources. But it leaves still this $11 billion gap. And so that's the gap. In order to finance education for all, starting in 2009, going on to 2015, if the total needed is 36 billion, if the resources that are available from countries leave 16 billion to be found, if the aid resources can only add 5 billion to that, there remains this 11 billion dollar gap. Now, for our purposes this week, notice two things very quickly. This assumes that there's no more money on this side of the chart. This assumes that there can't be any additional resources that come out of national funds. But in fact, there's lots of good evidence that there could be more resources. Think, for example, of all of the parents who are paying for private education. If one could capture even some of those resources, there'd be lots more resources for public education. Think about the possibilities of reorganizing the tax structure whether it's taxes on individual income, taxes on companies, taxes on uh, products flowing out of the country, wherever it is in the system, this assumes that none of that will change. And our for our purposes this week, we shouldn't make those assumptions. We should be asking what's not here. And what's not here is attention to how might that change. And similarly on this side, the presumption is that the aid system will stay pretty much as it is. And that therefore, uh, one might push this up a bit by beating more or less heavily on the aid agencies and get them to do more than two billion, but three billion or four billion. But the basic system will stay the same. And there's no good reason to assume that. That is, those of us who are trying to understand what's going on ought to start with the notion that they're not talking about it, but we need to talk about it. And how might a different aid scheme be organized which would generate additional resources to address the gap. It turns out that, there's, um, that the funding agencies have not been uh, providing anywhere near this promise of we will provide sufficient funding to make sure any country that has a reasonable plan. This is an effort to look at what was happening in the early part of the 2000s. The 2010 target is this, uh, this uh, round dot uh, where the countries are is the vertical bar in 2004. There was some prom promise that they would do a bit better by 2008. And that's the, the colored arrow. And most are trying to move toward the dot. A few are moving in the other direction. Uh, but they're not getting very close to what is the agreed world notion that they ought to be doing 0.7% of gross national income. And the only countries that actually get there are a few of are the Nordic countries and Luxembourg. Most of the other countries in the world do not. And for many of the other countries, the aid has been going down rather than up. So it's not a very promising picture about uh, foreign aid, uh, the, uh, this is another way of looking at, here's the average of the effort of the foreign aid providers. The target is out here. And as you can see, there are only a few countries that are meeting the target. So financing education in that respect by foreign aid turns out not to be very promising. Uh, I'm asking the question, who pays? Global commitment to education for all, national responsibility for paying for it. There's a funding gap. The, uh, the aid system doesn't uh, achieve that. And I'll mention very quickly a notion of redistributive funding that will come up later in the discussion. In most countries of the world, there is a clear expectation within the country that the tax system will be used in a way that effectively says those who have greater income will pay more for education but everybody can send their children to school. And it varies a bit on the country. In the US, that's primarily property taxes. In most other countries, it's primarily income tax. But either way, it works. If there is a reasonably progressive tax system, it effectively assumes that those of us who pay taxes are responsible for the education, not only of our own children or children in our community, but children elsewhere. So in the crudest sense of the term, uh, someone who is sitting in Paris who is paying, an affluent person sitting in Paris is paying taxes in Paris, understands the deal. And the deal is that the taxpayer in Paris is also funding the education of poor children in Marseille. And by and large, uh, although people grumble about taxes, 
there is an acceptance of that notion of the redistributive functioning of financing for education. Tax those who have more resources, let all the children go to school. It's not equal school, they don't have equal access, it's not comparable in quality, but it's not the case that poor children are to be. <laughs> Clearly there's discontent with the notion that it's not redistributive. I have somebody already lined up on this side saying it should be much more redistributive. Uh, what I'm offering is a bit of a teaser, and that is that uh, we need to begin to think about how to do that on a global scale. So we need to think about how it is that I as a Californian pay taxes in the understanding not only that I'm paying for the education of, other ch of the children of other people in California, or even potentially, although it's not very redistributive nationally in the U.S., a bit for our children elsewhere in the U.S., but I need to be paying taxes that provide more than a, than a trivial nothing for children in Bangladesh. I need to be paying taxes, if I'm accepting the notion of a global commitment to education for all, then I need to accept the notion that that redistributive funding of financing of education within countries needs to have a global parallel. It's a teaser, we're going to come back to that uh, later in the discussion. Attentive to time, I'm going to push on and talk about there are uh, consequences of this reliance on aid, and it has to do with the uh, ways in which countries become aid dependent. And aid dependence doesn't have to do with the volume of foreign aid. It has to do with the role it plays in the education system. So for Africa, historically, foreign aid was a very small percentage of total spending on education. That was because the foreign aid providers said that they weren't going to pay the teachers. That was a national responsibility. Foreign aid was going to be for special projects or reforms or innovations. So it was always 2 or 3% of the total spending on education. Uh, but it was the 2 or 3% that was available. So from the national perspective, all of the resources were taken up in paying the teachers with a little bit of resources left for some chalkboards, probably not even a projector, but a little bit of money left for a chalkboard or two, uh, probably not even enough for a map on the wall. Uh, and nothing left. And therefore, the foreign aid was the money that had some flexibility that people could use to do something else. So every time someone in an education ministry in Africa said, we need to reform this, or we need to change that, or we need to modify the textbooks, or we need a different kind of teacher education, how are we going to pay for it? They turned to the foreign aid system and said, we need some money. And who in the foreign aid system will provide that? And let's see if we can persuade Sweden or Denmark or the United States or England or uh, somebody to provide some assistance to do that. And the consequences of that are pretty powerful uh, because they end up with a dependence on that foreign aid and all of the stuff that comes with foreign aid. Foreign aid always carries conditions, whether they're explicit or not. Foreign aid carries assumptions about the way the world is organized, about what countries should be doing, often about what countries should be doing, not only in the education sector, but elsewhere in the economy. Uh, and all of that comes along with the foreign aid structure. And aid dependence then means that countries get sucked into all of that. For Africa, the situation has in some sense gotten both better and worse. Better in that there's a bit more foreign aid, so it turns out that funding agencies in about 10 or 12 African countries are actually paying the teachers. In Mozambique for 2009, uh, the estimate was that foreign aid was providing 56% of the recurrent budget of the country. Think about that for a minute. This is a country, right? A country. We're not talking about a small project. We're talking about a country. And 56% of the national budget, which means more than education and health put together is coming from foreign aid. So on the one hand, there's more foreign aid. On the other hand, where does that lead? And no one wants to talk about the way out. No one wants to talk about what the end of that process is. What that brings along with it is the terms vary. What was called for a long time a notion of a Washington consensus, a kind of global agreement on what it is that poor countries should be doing and how they should be doing that. For Africa, the particular form of that was called structural adjustment. That is, changes to the way in which the economy was organized, changes to the rules about 
collecting taxes, changes to the rules about foreign exchange, changes to the rules about repatriating profits, changes to the rules about the ways in which the different parts of the economy were organized. And that, I'm using here the term neoliberalism, uh, was the mechanism that was brought along with that aid dependence. You can see I'm beginning to shift now to the final part of my comments from who pays into why is it that way. Uh, and I'm, what I'm looking at is the, this process of a sense of the future, a sense of what needs to happen that emerges in the affluent countries. It turns out the World Bank is the principal organizer of how to say it. The World Bank becomes one of the principal enforcers along with the International Monetary Fund for the countries of the world that get funds from those two organizations about what they need to be doing. And it's a very powerful, powerful push that continues to this day. The World Bank 2020 education strategy has embedded within it many of this, those ideas of the Washington Consensus of neoliberalism about countries, about how they should behave, and so on. And in an odd sort of way, it's really compounded by several things. One is the decline of UNESCO and the increasing role of the World Bank in education. Think about why that is. UNESCO was the organization created at the end of World War II to look after education issues in the world. You remember in the creation of the UN in 1945, there were a set of technical agencies, one for health, uh, WHO, one for agriculture, FAO, and education, science, and culture, UNESCO. And over time, UNESCO's role has declined significantly. The World Bank now employs directly and indirectly more education researchers on Africa than any university or research institute in Africa. And my guess is, although it's hard to do the calculation, setting South Africa aside, then the whole of the continent put together are in the employee of the World Bank compared to researchers in Africa. Uh, it's also a moment in which there is the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the socialist bloc, and what that leads to in part is a sense of triumphalism in the United States in particular, in the West in general. We've won, they say, and we've won means that there are no alternative development strategies. I used to teach courses about alternative development strategies. If they do that now, people say I'm an anachronism. Uh, if I do that now, people say, well, there aren't any alternatives. And part of our job in this week is to think about alternatives. Part of our job is not to accept what is at the moment as necessarily what must be, but rather to look at what is at the moment and think about how did it get that way and how could it be different? And who must be involved in making it different and what must that look like? The triumphalism had another consequence which is really powerful. If you think you're right, then you have a moral obligation to tell other people what to do. Right? If you're absolutely convinced that you have wisdom and the others don't, then it's your job to tell other people what to do and you shouldn't feel guilty about that. You shouldn't be hesitant to say, this is the right way to run the world and here's your role in running the world or your place in the world and get with the program. Uh, Condi Rice, who was the former U.S. Secretary of State, wrote an article in the early 1990s in which she talked about the world and her argument was in simplistic terms something like this, that there is a development path and those who are not on the development path are either uh, ignorant, too dumb to realize that they're not on it, or uh, hopelessly stubborn and trying to hold out and impoverishing themselves as a result. So the only real strategy for poor countries was to get with the program. The only real strategy for poor countries was to get on that development path. And that comes out of this who pays uh, part, of the, uh, part of the argument. I said I put a few pictures in. Uh, I made the transition to why is that? So I started with the question about education for all is deceptively simple, right? The world said education for all, but not who's going to pay for it. Uh, we saw that uh, access to education and access to quality is hopelessly, not hopelessly, but is dramatically inegalitarian. And we also saw that trying to close this funding gap starts with assumptions about what's not going to change, national funding, the aid system. And then within that, doesn't close the gap. 
the outcome of those set, that set of assumptions is that most of the gap is still there. In crude terms, the global monitoring reports that I've been mentioning have been saying every year since 2002, the world is not on track. That was the title of the 2002 report, and in every single report, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, in every single one of those reports, there's a section that says, if the world keeps doing what it's doing, it's not going to make it. And so let it not be a surprise to any of us. It was clear in 2002, it was clear in 2000, and it's even more clear in 2012. And I've been starting to ask the question now, why is that? Why is that? If all these clever people understand what the problem is, and they identify the gap and why it's not getting closed, then why do we continue to go down this path? And what I'm trying to end up with here is that it's not an accident. It's not simply that there are stupid people who haven't thought about good ideas. It's not simply that uh, no one has come up with some idea about generating additional resources. It's rather that the global education system reflects a particular set of interests. And our task in particular is to ask, uh, as we think about why, uh, to think about wh wh how education is organized and uh, why it persists in, in being that way and to recognize that it is a very systematic pattern that has to do with how we think about education that has moved us away from the notion of education as a public good toward a notion of education as a commodity that's for sale in a market, away from a notion that public institutions are responsible for providing education, toward a notion that all sorts of providers are around and people can take their wallets out and put some money on the table and then have access to education. Away from ed notions of education policy that are rooted in thinking about learning and the learning process toward notions of education that think about, as an example, as a teaser, education as an investment. Looks like a really attractive idea to start with. It's human capital theory, right? Education is an investment in human capital that's analogous to the investment a manufacturer might make in physical capital, right? A manufacturer thinks about uh, buying new machinery to improve the production and reduce the cost of production, therefore get more profit. As a society, we ought to think about investing in education, investing in human capital in the same way. And what that does, here's the part that's not obvious, is it brings with it the tools of investment banking for making decisions about education. It brings with it, in this case, rate of return analysis for determining whether or not money should be allocated to basic, secondary, higher, vocational, technical, whatever education. How to know? Ask which yields the higher rate of return on the expenditure. Should more education go, more funding go to in-service teacher education or pre-service teacher education? Should more funding go to making smaller classes or producing better books? Should more funding go to changing the language of instruction or having more languages of instruction? If all of those issues are being decided in terms of rate of return analysis, then the educators have effectively been marginalized and all the thinking about learning, all the thinking that, about what will improve the education process, what will enable education to be developmental, what will enable education to be a process that permits learners to develop their capacities, get pushed aside in favor of these banking tools. So we've moved away from that notion of how to make decisions about learning, uh, about education that come out of learning thinking into uh, finance or into manufacturing education as production, then we stop talking about finance tools and we talk about manufacturing tools, efficiency, inefficiency in education, all of which uh, marginalizes thinking about education. Uh, and it makes it much more difficult for educators who are concerned about what's going on in the classroom to get a voice in the discussion. It makes it much more difficult. Give me two minutes and I'll finish, and then the floor is yours. Can we do that? OK. Uh, it makes it much more difficult for educators to uh, think about what's going on in learning terms in the classroom, because they're constantly being pressured to think about it in terms of investment in banking, in terms of production, sometimes in terms of delivery service. That's a common terminology now for education, and it's always puzzled me. Because I think of DHL as a delivery service, right? 
Huh? You, you order something or you send something to somebody, somebody arrives at your door and delivers it. But if education is an interactive process, constructing it as a delivery service effectively marginalizes the teachers and the learners. It effectively puts education where Paulo Freire had it as a banking model in which somebody's making deposits in the students' accounts, not challenging people to come up with ideas, not saying learners are capable and ought to be responsible for their learning, not learners are active participants in the learning process, but somebody's delivering something to them. Okay? What I've been trying to get at here is when we get to the why, the why is not accidental. It's not a mistake. It's not a, uh, an undesirable, untoward, unanticipated outcome. It has to do with how we think about education and about the consequences of education and about uh, the way in which education is conceptualized uh, that are effectively disempowering for educators, disempowering of the learning process. And what that leads me to conclude with is that for this afternoon and the rest of the week, we need to be asking some really hard questions about everything we talk about, whether we're talking about privatization or innovative financing or something very more technical, um, venture bonds or some, whatever it is. We need to be asking hard questions, the usual sorts of questions. What is the efficiency? What's the return on investment? Is there um, fe feasibility for whatever it is that's being proposed? And then we need to ask the next set of questions. Whose interests are being served by this scheme? Who will benefit from this scheme? Who will not? Who's less well served? And why is that a good idea? Why is it better for society to go down that path that serves those interests, recognizing that these other interests are not being well served? What is the equity outcome of a particular strategy? Is it the case that equity is promoted? Or does this strategy entrench inequalities yet further? Does education become a mechanism for differentiating and subordinating uh, in society? Who are the advocates? Who are the opponents of a particular strategy for financing education? And in the broadest sense, here's where I want to end up, mostly because I work on Africa a lot. A lot of the discussion in Africa is about uh, catching up, how to enable poor countries of the world to catch up with those who are more affluent. But th think about that as a metaphor, right? If you're running in a race and you're trying to catch up with whoever's in the front, what it means is you're always chasing somebody who's setting the direction. You're always chasing somebody who's deciding where to go. And here you are in the back trying to catch up with that. And what clearly needs to change is the metaphor. If education is to be developmental, if education is to be liberating, it has to be an education that enables people to set the pace. Not to be the followers behind trying to catch up, but making the breakthroughs that lead the outcomes in different directions. I wanted to end up with a student with attitude. Thank you.